Good evening, my name is Howard Edelman. I'm your host for Israel in the Jewish World. Now, one of the most unbelievable sights I witness when interviewing scientists at IMRIC, the Institute for Medical Research Israel-Canada at Hebrew U, was to observe a blind person see. He saw with his ears, not his eyes. We interview Amit Amadi, who heads up this unique experiment and visit the lab where the blind are taught to see with their ears. Then we move to a discussion of Iran. Academic experts try to explain why the Iranian leadership is so blind to history and so deaf to world opinion. Yossi then interviews Malcolm Lester, who has dedicated his life to publishing and teaching us how to see and hear anew. Stay with us. This is another in our series on the Israeli uh, research and innovation in medical science. We're interviewing scientists in the Institute for Medical Research, Israel Canada, and our guest today is Amir Amedi. Thank you for coming. It's a pleasure to be here. Now, you've done lots of work on vision, and I'm particularly interested in this because I had a roommate at college. Uh, his name was George King, and he went blind while in college. And I have another friend after college who got a fungus disease and went blind. And so your kind of work really fascinates me. But before we get into that, I want to get some background. How did you get into this field? What, you did postdoc research in the States, in Maryland, in New Orleans, and Harvard, etc., and did some work in England. How did that contribute to where you are? Um, well, it uh, contributed a lot uh, to where I am, uh, but it all started here in the Hebrew U, uh, where I did my PhD. What was your PhD on? Uh, my PhD was actually on merging of the senses, how the brain merged the senses, and on the capacity of the brain to reorganize. This is, means uh, sound and touch and yeah, visual? So, uh, yeah, exactly. So in the beginning we were interested, for example, to uh, see how vision and touch integrate is being integrated in the brain. As uh, one example, because touch was, uh, and its interaction with vision was very rarely uh, uh, studied. And uh, what we actually found led us to start working with the blind because- What uh, did you find? So what we found is a new brain area. Um, we called it uh, at, at the time LOTV, uh, lateral occipital tactile visual area. Because what we found is that this area, which uh, was, uh, taught for decades to be a visual center was activated the, and it was in the midst of the ventral visual stream. It's the stream in which we are recognizing objects. I recognize your face, etc., uh, etc. Et I, I, I know what is the shape and form of things in the world. Is actually being activated as much when we touch objects, but not when we hear sounds of objects. Well, not when we hear, just no, touch. if we hear a, a rooster, uh, doing uh, or, a, or a dog uh, barking, it's not active at all. But if we touch uh, a dog or a tool or look at it, uh, then this area is active uh, dramatically, like millions of neurons are firing uh, there very strongly. And that wasn't known before? And that wasn't known. So that's and an innovation. That yeah, so this led us to, to a, a theory that I actually continue to work uh, with in uh, Boston uh, with Alvaro Pasqualeone, a, th a theory which is actually look at the brain in a little bit different way than it was, uh, than people used to think about the brain so far. Uh, because uh, the main uh, ideas about the brain uh, were that, uh, uh, and this is one of the most fundamental questions about the brain. What, what's going on when I'm experiencing the world? Now I'm listening to you and I'm looking at you and I'm you know, experiencing all this rich thing. Um, is that the brain takes all this and breaks it to many, many pieces. Many, many small pieces. And each part of the brain is interested in a very, very particular aspect of the external world. So it was thought that uh, all the back of our brain is dedicated to vision actually around 20 to 30 percent 
of, of the brain is dedicated to vision, and some other parts are dedicated to touch in the parietal cortex. And then even within the visual cortex, a very specific area is interested in analyzing the color of the world, and a different area is interested in the uh, movements in the world, etc., etc. Thing. Exactly, fantastic. So, so the, the so, and one fundamental question is, we don't feel the world as as a, as break to many many aspects. Right, right. We we have a holistic uh, view of the world. So, how this is being done, and this division of labor between the senses and brain areas, and within each uh, brain area, each function within each sense, this is the division of labor principle. It's it's it poses a, a huge question. How do we bind everything to it? How do we merge the senses? And this is something that interests me from the beginning till now. And um, so this basically was the, the finding. And the fact that we found a brain area in the visual stream that is actually as active for touch led us to think that maybe this division of labor is true, but it's not division of labor for senses, as most of the people used to think, but it's for a specific function. That yeah, so the is. function that we, we thought, what is shared by vision and by touch and is not shared and, and, and is not present in, in uh, audition. And what we found was that uh, actually the, ge the actual geometrical 3D shape of objects is very, very similar in vision and in touch. Oh, because see. when we take a given... Uh, I don't know. Round. Yeah, a, b a bottle, or or we we palpate a given uh, uh, toy of a dog. We we have a very specific idea of this shape, in ch in vision and in touch, and in audition it's it's missing because it's completely by association. So for I just give you a quick example. If tomorrow, uh, all the dogs in the world would start doing meow. Right? <laughs> in the beginning, it will sound a little bit weird, right? And all the cats will do ruff ruff, okay? Or how, how, I don't know. Every <laughs> country have a different uh, sound for this, right? So in the beginning, it will be very weird. But let's say it will continue for a week. Then, after that week, if you are in your bed and you hear meow meow, that you know in your door you have a dog. So it's all, so it's all by association. But if you palpate this, the dog can't change to, to a horse or to a rooster, right? And in vision, the same. The shape will remain the same. So the idea was that the brain areas, the metamodal idea is that these brain areas are having a given task in life, a, a, different, a given mission in life. In this case, is retrieving the shape of things. And then it doesn't matter where we get this information from. And this actually led us to study blind individuals. Because we said, let's go to study congenitally blind individuals. Because congenitally blind individuals uh, never had vision and never had visual recollections. So when they touch, this is pure touching, right? This is the most pure form of touching without any associations to vision. If also in congenitally blind, um, we would find this activity in this LOTV area, we, we know we have a better uh, uh, evidence that this area indeed is interested in, in 3D geometrical shape. Well, okay. is that how that blind Turkish painter, I read in one of your yeah, paintings, yeah. that he paints, he feels it all uh, yeah. first and then paints, Right. it almost looks like he saw it all. Exactly, so we think the same mechanisms are, are present in every human being if it's sighted or congenitally blind, if it's painting or not painting. Uh, his case was a very special case in which we could ask him to communicate the shape in his mind through his paintings and, and scan his brain. And actually we did find activation in him uh, within this LOTV area, but also in any other congenitally blind that palpated shapes. But how do you do color? You don't feel color. Yeah, that's a good, that's a good one. And, and actually this, this one we wanted we want to study at some point, but we, we oh, haven't studied yet. yet. Yeah. Okay. But what we know from what we know from him is that he's doing it by associations, just like uh, sounds. Okay. 
because oh, in the beginning he used to throw there is actually some very interesting uh, anecdotes with with him so in the beginning he used to draw and then put uh, he didn't draw at all with colors and then he started to play with colors and then he put all these weird colors he would uh, take a watermelon and uh, make it purple in the in the center and then people used to tell him listen watermelon it's uh, red in the center and green in the out so you start doing this and, pe- and then people used to tell him, you know, this is really cool, but uh, you know that if you are uh, drawing the sun, then there is uh, shades. So he started to in the other direction. So he learned it. So then he started to draw shades, but they were with color. He drew it with color. Oh, and people, no, shades don't have color. So, you know, this, this type of... Uh, uh, some things, they are, I think, inherent, like our ability to represent shape and to draw shape, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. Uh, even to to represent perspective, that was amazing because even though he never uh, saw, he was able to draw things or objects uh, within a one per- one point of view, and then we would tell him now draw it from as if a sighted person would look at from the top, and he would draw it like this. So this is this says that there is some. Intrinsic. Uh, yeah, Piaget mix. had that a whole concept yeah, that it was built yeah. in. Let's take a break and come back, and we'll get into some of your own particular work. Sounds good. <laughs> 